Thank you, Dennis. Uh, can you hear me in the back? All right? Great, great. So as Dennis said, I was a geologist before I was an oceanographer. Uh, and when I uh, was studying geology, I learned a lot of things about the way that the ocean has changed in the past and how much different it has been at different times in the past. So I'd like you to think for a minute about uh, an ocean that is totally unlike the one that we see when we look out to the east. For example, the ocean formed about 4 billion years ago. And until 3 billion years ago, so for a billion years of the ocean, there was no oxygen in the ocean. There wasn't any oxygen in the atmosphere either. But the ocean, there, we already have abundant evidence that the ocean uh, had life in it, even at this very, very early stage, and even without oxygen. It was microbial life, and a wide variety of organisms can live without oxygen. In fact, some of the microbiologists refer to that event when oxygen started as the great oxygen catastrophe, <laughs> rather than uh, the way, way we might think of it as paving the way toward us. Um, from about 600 million to 800 million years ago, we think that the ocean was totally covered with ice. Uh, it's referred to as the snowball earth. And that's a, just a cartoon. You can't see it very well there, but you can, you can see some uh, features that we know were there, mountains and everything, sticking up on the continents through, through the ice. And 85 million years ago, the ocean was so warm that there are crocodile ancestors that were living around the Arctic Ocean. And that's one of the skeletons of uh, these creatures. They lived in, uh, the, the fossil record is from Sweden. So there have been lots of different oceans out there, if you will. And yet, oceanographers have started really worrying about the change and the rate of change that we're seeing in the ocean. And in January of this year, before I came to Harbor Branch, I was uh, honored to chair uh, a major ocean science meeting called Our Changing Oceans. And people talked about what was changing, how fast it was changing, and why they were concerned about it. So I'd like to share a little bit about that, and in some of it, bring it home here to Florida. The reason that people are concerned about this now, given the fact that the ocean was frozen over, and it was warm, and it was totally anoxic in the past, and, all, and there was vibrant life in the ocean at all of those times, was that it was very different life. It was a very different ocean. And of course, our whole civilization has emerged in about the last 3,000 years. And our economy has emerged in about the last 150 years. And it's very dependent on the way the ocean is now, its relationship to us through climate, and what results from that ocean. So that's why people are worried about changing oceans when they've been so different in the past. So some of uh, the second reason is that some of these changes are happening much more rapidly than anything we've ever seen in the geologic record. So we're very concerned about whether the ocean will be able to adapt to them or not. And what I'm going to talk to you about is data that's based from many, many oceanographic cruises from many different sources of information, and the wonderful scientists who go out with their equipment uh, to, to study the ocean and to study how things have changed in the past. 
I'm going to talk to you about three things that we worry about. And the first one is the acidification of the ocean, making the ocean more acid. So some of you may have seen this uh, graph before. It's a record from 1960 to present day of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And of course, it's going up. This, is, uh, this uh, curve was, uh, or the, the location of, of this particular uh, record is on the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. It was started in 1955 uh, by Charles David Keeling. Uh, wonder, uh, and uh, uh, even though it's an atmospheric record, he was an oceanographer. And he was studying it because he wanted to know why CO2 always uh, seemed to be constant in his area. And so he was trying to understand the long-term record of it. And for those of you that are very close up, you'll see that it has this little sawtooth red uh, line here. And that's the actual record, and the black is the average. And that sawtooth is actually the change in CO2 in the atmosphere every year from what happens in the northern hemisphere with the die-off of, uh, or not the die-off, but the dropping of leaves and browning of plants and, and um, uh, defoliation during the, the winter. So the CO2 goes up because the plants aren't taking CO2 out, and during the summer, CO2 goes down a little bit. So the, the big thing is that this is going up routinely. There are seven other places on the planet where it's being monitored, and all of them show the same signal. And of that CO2 that goes up into the atmosphere, the ocean takes up a major piece of it. Uh, almost 26% of our emissions into the atmosphere are taken up by the ocean. And they have a very big impact on the chemistry and biology of the ocean. And here's that same curve, the red. Uh, for less time than we've been measuring it in the atmosphere, we've been measuring it on a routine basis in the surface ocean. And this little blue squiggly line are the measurements of CO2 in the surface of the ocean off Hawaii, very close to where the CO2 atmosphere record is coming from. And this line represents the pH. And the pH is a measure of the acidity. The lower the pH, the more acid. So pH is declining as the ocean takes up CO2. So what happens when CO2 goes into water? You see it most days, uh, if you drink soda, uh, as the, the fizzy stuff in your soda. It has CO2 dissolved in it, and it makes the soda acid. pH is measured on a scale of 0 to 14. And 0 is very acid, and 14 is very alkaline, or sometimes called very basic. And 7 is neutral. So your soda has a pH of 2.5. So it's really a pretty acid thing. Vinegar is 3.4. It's a little less acid than a soda pop. Lemon juice is about 1.8, 2, depending on the lemon. Um, so it's more acidic than that. The ocean used to have a pH of about 8.13 uh, 100, 150 years ago. And now, it's only very slightly less. It's 8.08. .08. And yet, we're very worried about that. And that's because the pH controls many other things in the ocean, and they, and they vary much more rapidly than the pH. And one of those is the concentration of a component of the carbon system uh, Call, uh, the, that's the carbonate ion. And the carbonate ion is what controls whether things can make their skeletal material out of calcium carbonate. So that's corals, uh, shelly material, uh, all kinds of things in the ocean make skeletal material out of calcium carbonate. And before we started putting CO2 in the atmosphere, the saturation of that uh, 
that element that allows them to do that was shown on this map, and the red are high concentrations of the, of the carbonate ion, and blue are low concentrations. So they're nice high concentrations in all the low latitude areas. And this is actually colored in colors that are related to the ability of corals to make skeletal material. So red is optimum, blue is forget about it, green is not so good, marginal. And as we look forward, what we see in the future is partly going to be controlled by what we put in the atmosphere for CO2, but the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere has not yet equilibrated with the ocean. So no matter what we do, with fossil fuel burning in the future, the oceans are still going to get more acid for more than 300 years. So that's the little map that you saw before. This is the way the same map looks now. So that's how much we've changed the chemistry that controls the ability of organisms to make skeletal material. So you see that all of those areas that you always hear about with, with corals, like Tahiti and the Great Barrier Reef and so forth, are still fine. And little Florida here has a little bit of red around it. Uh, but the rest of the area is getting very marginal for corals. This is the projection for the year 2040. So that's only 28 years from now. And everything has become very marginal. And the end of the century, uh, it's very low. So this is what scientists are worried about. And of course, those are projections for the future. We know that it's going to become more acid regardless of what happens with CO2, but we fear that that this could be the future. And of course, that would mean that uh, our grandchildren right now could be the last generation that would see living coral reefs. Sort of a stunning thought. But there are other things besides corals that make um, skeletal material out of calcium carbonate. And we're worried about those as well. Um, these are pictures of a little organism that's a marine snail. It's actually only about maybe a millimeter long, and it's called a pteropod. And it also makes calcium carbonate shells. And pteropods are a very important piece of the food chain. They're very important off Georgia's Bank in New England, where I spent a lot of my career. They're also very important in the great southern ocean around Antarctica. And we're seeing the effects of acidification on pteropods much more quickly than we are uh, even with corals. So people are worried about the impact on the food chain. There's another, uh, these are the microscopic shells of uh, a little organism that's a photosynthesizer in the, the ocean. And uh, when, the, when there's low CO2s, uh, these are our lab tests, everything looks fine. When there's high CO2, they start to be etched away. Right now, this, this whole CO2 and acidity problem is severe enough that it's affecting larval success for oysters uh, on the, the, in the Northwest Pacific. So NOAA right now has to make a prediction of the upwelling which has even uh, has the lowest uh, CO, or I'm sorry, the lowest pH waters, uh, so that the oyster aquaculture industry in Oregon can pull the larvae out, so that they aren't harmed by acidification. So we're already starting to see the effects of this, but as I said, we're very worried about what happens with the food chain effects between phytoplankton, like the one that I show, showed you, and its, its um, relationship to other organisms and eventually to larger creatures in the ocean. There are some organisms that like lower pH, so not everybody is a loser here, 
but uh, it's something of great concern. Another problem that we're seeing and that we worry a lot about, and that's warming oceans. So this is a map of the satellite uh, data for the temperature of the surface ocean, uh, and this is for uh, just a, a couple weeks ago. Um, and obviously it's warm at the, in the tropics and cooler at the poles. But when we look at the, the integrated record throughout the entire ocean and over the whole ocean, we see that it has this pattern of increase in temperature. It's a very small amount, but it's definitely there. And because the, the, it, it affects the whole ocean, uh, it is starting to have effects in, that we can actually see. So we know that the Arctic Ocean, for example, is warming. And every summer, the, the sea ice in the Arctic melts back a little bit. And we have what's the, called the Arctic sea ice summer minimum, which is usually in the month of September. And this is the map of ice cover in the Arctic in 1979 in September. And this is what it looked like in 2007. Now, 2007 was an unusual year. The, the red is the summer sea ice extent, and that's 2007. It came back a little bit, but it's still below the, even the average line for the last 30 to 35 years. And one of the reasons that people are very concerned about that is that the ice is white. It reflects sun away. The ocean, when you look at it from space, is dark blue. So all of the open ocean absorbs even more heat. So this is a feedback loop that can lead to more warming. And again, for all of these things, uh, you know, there are different perspectives. This is a map of the Arctic Ocean. There's the Russian uh, coast, Alaska, Canada, Greenland. And the colors are the areas that have been claimed by the Arctic nations. And the Arctic Ocean in international law is governed by what's called the Arctic Council. So it's the countries that actually have territorial claims on the Arctic. And they set the rules for what happens in the Arctic with respect to international treaties, transportation, uh, fishing, uh, many, many things. And they have observers. So Sweden is a permanent observer for the Arctic Council, even though Sweden doesn't have any coastline on the Arctic, because you know they live up there, it's important to them, and so forth. The European Union is, uh, is a, a permanent observer on the Arctic Council. And guess who has applied for permanent observer status now? <laughs> South Korea, the largest, uh, largest shipping um, GDP percentage of any country in the world, and China. Because, of course, it would be, if the Arctic Ocean opens up during the summer, it would be a lot easier for them to ship products to Europe through the Arctic than to go any other way. Others look at this, too. This is one of the primary areas of study of the Navy, both from a standpoint of science and from a standpoint of policy. Uh, because they're very concerned about what happens if the Arctic is open. Not only because there's Russia and there's the US and open water, but also because of all of these issues like shipping, uh, r a real transformation in uh, geopolitics. So again, some could look at this as uh, a winning strategy or a potential for a winning strategy. Most climate scientists would consider it a catastrophe because of the potential for a feedback loop that would warm the oceans. Uh, another area that we're very concerned about, sea level rise. This is the record of sea level rise globally from 1880 uh, to the present. And much of the 
the sea level rise in the late part of the 1800s uh, was simply responding to uh, the melting of glaciers uh, that was happening naturally and had been happening for quite a long time. But then it started an increase that was much more rapid. So this was still a very small amount of change. So up until uh, 2000, sea level rise between Daytona and Fort Lauderdale was about uh, an inch a decade. So not a big change. But this has begun to change a lot. And there are two reasons. One is the warming of the ocean. That heats up the water. Hot water has a greater volume than cold water, and it's actually enough to create sea level rise. About um, 7 to 10 inches by the end of the century. The second piece, of course, is the continuing melting of glaciers. And I can see that this is not going to show up very well at the back. But maybe if we look at the top one first, this is a valley. Uh, in the Andes above Lima, Peru. And this is its glacier, and this is a little lake. In 1978, that lake was not there. The glacier came, essentially filled the valley. And uh, this is typical of mountain glaciers around the world. A tremendous amount of melting. Uh, it's a big issue for water supply. This particular glacier is the water supply for the city of Lima, Peru. Seven million people uh, who are dependent on a supply that is currently projected to end in about 25 years. Uh, again, it's a projection. So one of the, the biggest uh, ice sheets on land that is melting is, of course, the Greenland ice sheet. And the red, the, essentially, each of these is a contour uh, of the increase in the maximum extent of summer ice melt in Greenland. And it has been increasing steadily as well. And this is what's been happening over the last approximately um, 30 years. It, it, it's based on satellite data, so our record is only as long as the satellite data. Uh, so all of our projections about sea level rise are really dependent on our ability to synthesize a tremendous amount of data on what's happening on mountain glaciers and, and in, in Greenland and Antarctica and so forth. And when people want to really scare us in Florida, they show us a map like that. Uh, and that's a map if, if all of Greenland and all of Antarctica melted, uh, which isn't going to happen anytime soon. Don't worry about that. Uh, that's what Florida would look like. But let's talk about some uh, things that are more realistic. Uh, so this is a big issue for Florida, and Florida is really paying attention to it. Uh, the South Florida Water Management District, the Indian River Water Management District, and others have been working with scientists to understand how the models of projection are made, how accurate they are, what the variables are that are associated with them. And their current uh, estimate uh, is that uh, our area um, would have approximately three feet, one meter, rise of sea level by the end of the century. So this is us. Here's uh, Fort Pierce and Vero. And the red here is all of the area that would be inundated with a one meter rise in sea level by the end of the century. Uh, so the predictions range from two feet. That's the best so far to five feet. Um, and of course, we need to know how realistic those are. So what are we, uh, you know, I've given you a lot of things that, that really scare oceanographers. And they, they scare oceanographers because you know, we're living on the planet too. Uh, and we feel a real responsibility 
uh, to understand these processes and to give everybody good information about it. And, and that's uh, uh, often a, uh, and, and you know, you'll definitely hear scientific debates about it, but I've tried to give you the information that's the consensus. But I am still optimistic about our future. And I'd like to tell you some of the reasons why. And a lot of them have to do with things that are going on here at Harbor Branch and at Florida Atlantic. So those of you who are regulars at the seminar series will have seen some of these pictures. Uh, Brian LaPointe's photos of brain corals in Key West. Incidentally, the longest sea level gauge record in the entire country is the Key West record. So we have the best record for this area of any place. This is uh, Josh Voss and his work on coral health. Uh, he and Sarah Edge and many of the others in their laboratory uh, work to understand how healthy corals are, what the stress of acidification will be relative to the stresses of other um, impacts on them, um, pollution, nutrient loading, uh, coral diseases, and so forth. Uh, and then those of you who were at John Reed's seminar earlier um, in the series saw his wonderful pictures of the Oculina reefs and other deep water reefs uh, off Florida. So the people here at Harbor Branch, uh, together with many others, but this is our backyard, are very much engaged in trying to understand what's happening with corals and coral systems, and to, to work with others who work on the chemistry of carbon in the ocean to understand how realistic these projections are, and if they are realistic uh, for how much CO2 we're going to have, what the impact will be on corals, on organisms that secrete calcium carbonate, and on other parts of the, the food chain. And I believe that, that uh, they will come up with some very interesting uh, observations that are going to help us address this problem. You can't see that very well, but it says, Southeast Florida's resilient water resources, adaptation to sea level rise, uh, and, and uh, temperature associated with climate change. This was a major study that was funded by the uh, federal government for the Southeast Florida region. And it was Florida Atlantic who took the lead on getting people together from all of the various areas of, uh, of Florida. And they brought in experts not only from Florida and the US, but also international experts to help them understand these models for sea level rise and how accurate they were. And so our understanding of them is really being fostered and synthesized by activity that's going on right here at Florida Atlantic University. <coughs> on the food side, of course, you know that uh, Florida, uh, that Harbor Branch uh, really is uh, a leader in the aquaculture of marine organisms, whether those are snails, conch, uh, other, uh, other shellfish, or whether it's sport fish or food fish. Uh, what, the, what we try to do is to understand whether those can be grown in tanks on land to take pressure off the, the marine environment for generating food and, uh, and sport fish re, uh, restocking, but also uh, as a, a, certainly for economic development as well. And so I think that we're seeing a trend toward uh, activities that are going to take some of the pressure off of our wonderful and vulnerable uh, lagoon and, and uh, coastal region. And that's another one of the ways that we work on it. Another example from, uh, from FAU working very closely between ocean engineering and Harbor Branch is work that's been undertaken to understand whether we could harness the tremendous energy of the Florida current and use it to turn turbines that would generate power. And uh, just two weeks ago, 
just off um, Fort Lauderdale, there was a test cruise. That test cruise was really of the platform uh, for this activity. The, the platform and, its and the turbines and all of the engineering that goes on with it are being done together between Harbor Branch and, um, and the Ocean Engineering Department. And of course, the promise is that we might be able to substantially enhance uh, the power that's available to us without burning fossil fuels, whether they're coal or oil or natural gas or whatever. Uh, it certainly isn't a power source that would, would provide energy for the whole United States. But projects like this and those in other areas, in other coastal areas, could dramatically decrease our dependence on oil. And of, and of course, uh, I know that you look. You have looked at the pumps as you've gone by them in the last couple months, stunned as each day uh, the the price goes up. And of course, foreign oil is a, is a critical dependency of ours in a strategic sense too. So in all of these ways, the research that's going on here at Harbor Branch, and now that we're partners with part of uh, Florida Atlantic in partnership with Florida Atlantic, really are working on the most vexing problems of our times. And I think that you should be very proud that the scientists here are working on these issues that are so central to our lives here, to the rest of Florida, and to the rest of the world. There was a time before I was a geologist that I thought I would ma major in, in uh, microbiology. And I remember my labs with the petri dish and the, the auger uh, in it and the little inoculations that we would make. And any of you who have done that in school or in labs or whatever know that uh, it works by the law of geometric progression. And it, th those little colonies of microbes grow very slowly at first. But when they get to this stage, it's only a day or so before they fill the entire petri dish. And one of the most eloquent ecologists of our times, E.O. Wilson, used this as a metaphor for our Petri dish. <laughs> Thinking about the limited resources that we have, even though it's a huge planet, our impact on it, and urging us to think about what we do, the way we use our resources, the way we husband our intellectual resources as well, to ensure that our children and our grandchildren have this beautiful environment to live in. So I'm very proud to be here at Harbor Branch. I'm delighted to meet all of you and to work with the scientists here. I think that we're doing critical and very, very exciting things. Thank you.